Olympic standards, AV1, VVC, and AI-assisted encoder implementations. This session will be moderated by Mark Donegan. Mark leads the market development efforts at Visionula, a company building advanced video technology. Mark is a veteran of the video ecosystem, having worked with disruptive innovation companies to increase video codec and streaming technology standards adoption. Mark, it's great to have you here. Throughout the talk, I'd like to encourage the audience to put any questions in the questions tab to the right of your screen. And we'll try to get to those towards the end of the session. Mark, the floor is yours. Excellent. Well, thank you, Max. Uh, super excited to be here. Thank you for joining us. So uh, the title speaks for itself, understanding the latest video codec standards. It's a, it's a huge topic. Uh, it's a bit bewildering at times. And so we really hope that over this next hour that we're going to be able to uh, unpack and maybe provide some clarity as to specifically what's happening in AV1, VVC, and not exactly a codec standard, but we will be touching on AI and machine learning assisted encoder implementations as I think this is becoming a, a much greater part of the video ecosystem and certainly a topic that I'm sure many of you are interested in. So here's the goals for the session. Uh, really pretty simple. Number one, uh, myself and the panelists uh, would like you to walk away and say, wow, it is possible to move to an advanced codex standard. Uh, again, the decisions are very complex. There's a lot of considerations, but hopefully you're gonna leave this session and that's gonna be uh, one of the main takeaways is that it's possible we don't need to uh, be planning for five years in the future. Maybe we can be planning uh, in a much closer time frame. Uh, the second is relative to the subject of real-time uh, communications, real-time experiences, RTE, is that advanced codecs can support real-time video. So throughout, we're going to be heavily focused. We will be talking about VOD applications, but largely we're going to be focused on live, uh, low-latency um, type applications and use cases. So with that, um, let's get started. And I would like the panelists to uh, go ahead and introduce themselves and uh, tell us where you're from, who you work for, and uh, what you do. Let's go ahead and start with Jan. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Jan de Kok. I'm director for codec development at Cinemedia. Uh, I'm based out of Belgium. Um, now, Cinemedia is a global provider of video networking solutions. We provide the entire chain uh, of uh, encoding, packaging, delivery, all the way to the CDN. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is strongly rela related, of course, with the, let's say, real-time experience that we'll be talking about today. So glad to be part of this panel here. All right. Uh, thank you. So I am not going in any particular order here, uh, guys, so I apologize for that. Uh, Sean, I'll go ahead and, and uh, why don't you introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, my name is Sean Zhou. I work for Agora. Agora is an active proponent for real-time engagement, and we provide a platform as a service solution for, for real-time engagement. And uh, yeah, it's uh, great that we have this opportunity to discuss advanced video codec for real-time engagement. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And we certainly thank Agora for putting on this event. Um, uh, DeBarga? Okay, good morning. Uh, so my name is DeBarga, I work for uh, Google. So I'm a principal engineer in Google. And uh, right now I'm looking at next generation video codec technologies uh, which could potentially be a next gen uh, aom codec uh, prior to that i have uh, led the av1 algorithmic development efforts from google side and prior to that i worked on vp9 uh, so these are and so we are, our team is a very good, big proponent of royalty free ecosystems and codecs and our plan is to continue doing that as long as uh, we can <laughs> and happy to be part of this panel and take part in the discussions. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, certainly, last but not least, uh, Tarek. 
Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tara Kamara. I'm the um, engineering manager for the video transcoding team at Twitch. Um, Twitch, uh, for those who don't know it, is uh, one of the uh, biggest live streaming platform um, covering gaming, entertainment, day-to-day um, -day experiences, and new applications as well. Um, this team is mainly focused on um, enabling better video delivery at lower cost, at scale, at low latency, at lots of other competing goals against each other. Um, we are also the team behind the IVS, the Interactive Video Services, which is a new, well, a new, um, a year old now, um, new service enabling developers and other companies and simplifying and facilitating uh, live streaming for those. So I'm super excited to be here. It's excellent. We're happy to have you. Well, I'd like to start. We've prepared a couple slides here uh, that we are going to go over. And just to set the stage of exactly where we are in the development of, of this multi-codec uh, world. And so, Jan, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you put a couple slides together, and then we're going to have uh, DeBarga and with an overview of the AV1 ecosystem. A uh, lot of really up-to-date information here. So, um, Jan. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so this is a visualization that um, I'd like to use just to illustrate the adoption of the different formats. As you know, there are plenty of formats out there for video compression. And um, yeah, we're going through different stages. But actually, the let's say fragmentation in this multi-codec world is increasing. And actually, it's also accelerating. Now, what you see here on this slide, and um, I'll just go through the highlights here, is on the left side, um, a depiction of the broadcast situation. The broadcast world typically has been evolving a bit more slowly. Um, it's more hardware driven. So there's a lot of install base. It takes a bit longer. Um, in any case, at the moment, at the top left, this is more or less the situation today um, where you see that AVC is still occupying the, the bulk of the, of the traffic there. MPEG-2, it's a very old standard, um, more than 25 years old, but it's still out there. And um, it's, uh, I mean, even these days, you would see new deployments for MPEG-2. But in any case, you also see HVC coming up. There's some momentum there. So it's, it's slowly evolving. And at the bottom left, you see projections for the coming three to five years where HVC is slowly growing. But you also see new contenders coming up. And today we'll be talking about VDC, which is, um, I would say, could be, a, uh, let's say, a successor to HVC, but also maybe AV1 can pick up in the broadcast world. Um, on the right side, then, um, that this is the OTT delivery space, um, where typically innovation goes faster. There's more software deployments. Um, where you see that there's already more fragmentation. AVC is still very big out there, but you already have HVC and you also have royalty-free formats. Um, the momentum is really there for VP9 a couple of years ago, but now also AV1 is already becoming bigger and bigger. And as we'll be talking about it, also that AV1, there's plenty of deployments, there's plenty of encoders, decoders out there that allow it to be deployed widely. In a couple of years, um, I mean, I would say AV1 will continue to grow We'll also see how VVC is doing if they, um, and how the licensing situation will turn out there. Um, but this is roughly, I would say, how, how we can expect the situation to evolve. Yeah. Don't, quote, don't quote me on the measurements on these graphs and the, and the numbers, but uh, these would roughly indicate the tendencies. Well, that's for the first slide. Uh, thanks, Mark. And then on the second slide, I try to summarize uh, the different, uh, the situation or the, the status for the different um, formats. Tarek, you might recognize this is actually uh, based on uh, a slide that I that I saw from you at, at Streaming Media, um, okay. <laughs> slightly updated. So feel free to correct me here or jump in. Um, but these are, I would say, yeah, the biggest formats out there now, ranging from AVC over HVC, but also VP9, AV1. Uh, and then there's a couple of new formats that were standardized last year, VVC, LCVC, and EVC. Now, there's still some question marks definitely at the bottom, but what you see also in terms of compression efficiency, there's several interesting contenders, um, AV1 and VVC again, um, that are ready to be used. Um, you also see more and more encoders, also open source encoders being made available 
and shared uh, what and you can see them on the right hand side but also what's interesting is that formats like vp9 and, and now also ev1 ha already have quite some support on browsers ce devices uh, and also to, important for today real-time support uh, for example on rtp and web rtc so yeah we will probably uh, will likely also um, come back to that later on in this um, in this panel yes we will excellent thank you jan Okay, Debarga, how is AV1 developing? Yeah, so this is kind of like the time when we are three years after the initial release of AV1. So it's a good uh, time to actually look at what the proliferation of different software services and hardware has been. So there, this uh, slide has four sections. I just put in a lot of the uh, logos of different devices and different services that are using AV1 today. So Windows, in terms of software support, we have Windows 10, Chrome, Android, and it's supported on browsers, the Firefox, uh, Chrome. Chrome was obviously the, one of the first to support uh, everyone decoding, Edge, then Videoland. In terms of web services, YouTube, again, being one of the first to uh, start using everyone. Now it's slowly coming into Netflix and Facebook and Qi. And then um, in terms of real-time services, we have Duo and, and uh, Cisco Webex starting to use everyone also. In terms of hardware adoption, we have uh, in, uh, for desktop chips, the chips from NVIDIA, MediaTek, AMD, and Intel that are supporting everyone. Uh, in turn, the, in the smart TV space, I think this year, this year is the year where we actually have a lot of TV models that are supporting everyone like from LG, Sony, Samsung, TCL, Toshiba, Vizio, and in terms of streaming boxes, Roku supports everyone as well. And in smartphones, we have Samsung phones that support everyone, the Xiaomi and Vivo and Oppo also starting to support uh, everyone. So this is in a very, uh, like a, a, a brief nutshell of the adoption. And all of these are, are set to grow over the next uh, year or so. Yes, they really are. Well, that's excellent. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, thank you, Jan. Thank you, DeBarga, for uh, the overview there. And so hopefully that helps uh, for those that maybe are not uh, able to monitor the emerging situation, specifically around AV1, uh, but also VVC and some of the other standards. So I just want to jump right into the conversation. This is, this is why we're here, and I really can't wait to facilitate this talk. And I think a really good place for us uh, to begin is to discuss and, and have some conversation around what are the steps that need to be completed when you're beginning to think about how to compare codecs. And uh, so this is going to be a, kind of a free-for-all question here. So I'll let kind of the first person to jump in uh, begin to talk about this. But panelists, if you could give your thoughts around what, how should someone even approach um, evaluating a, a, a codec, thinking about AV1 versus VVC, or maybe they've not even migrated yet to HEVC and thinking about that? And then also codec implementations, because I think it's very important that we not just focus on the codec, but we think about the actual encoder implementations. So, Let's throw it out there, and uh, who who wants to jump in and give some thinking around this? I'm probably happy to share how we look at this and how it's a very tough question, by the way. Um, yeah. It's it's there is no one way to do it. There is it really depends on how you want to approach it. The way we approach, at least, is very very business driven. So um, obviously, delivering better quality of service, lower bit rates. Um, is definitely everyone's goal or most of people's goal as well, in addition to delivering new features, lower latency, and those kind of stuff. Um, the way we look at this is, um, number one is we're not arguing uh, the compression savings because there is no reason for us moving to a new codec without compression savings. And the challenge for us, at least, we are real-time application, and this is basically probably the focus of this panel, uh, we need to achieve real-time at scale um, and that's super challenging. So the way I'm looking at this on, from an encoding point of view is where the industry stands, what is everyone doing, 
uh, what are the capability? Is this cost number one? Is, is this product capable of delivering real time at a reasonable cost for a scalable solution for hundreds of thousands or maybe tens of hundreds of thousands of channels uh, concurrently? Um, that's one part of it. I don't want to jump the gun a little bit on talking about ecosystem as well, because adopting a solution, you can, you can have the best solution in the world. Um, you can say 50% of the bits and it is very cheap to deploy. But if people cannot watch it, if it doesn't have enough reach, and this is more of the ecosystem support, it's something we would like to see happening as we identify, yes, codec are fit from a, a, a broadcast or a, a distribution point of view, the other complementary side, which is always a need, is does the ecosystem and is the delivery ready to start consuming that product? Excellent. What else? Yeah. Um, Mark, I also like to share a few observations and experiences that we have in selecting the codec. And first, evaluating the a coding formats, a coding standard is very different from evaluating a codec selection for RTC or RTE usage. Because the real RTC environment is very challenging. The transmission network has to be considered. The network itself is with packet loss. And sometimes with a packet loss rate as high as 80%, we saw that more often than not. So the codec used for RTE has to be pack loss resilient and also of low latency. And because the network is also congested very often and it's jittery as well. So the video coding will need to give very good quality of experience from end-to-end -end transmission, especially when the network condition is changing and challenging. So we need to take into the consideration of the network status. And we need to have a way to detecting the network status. For example, it's bandwidth, available bandwidth. When the bandwidth varies, we need to be able to adapt the video codec so that the some kind of scalability can be built into the encoded implementation. And, and all those factors are actually in addition to the traditional evaluation for the codec is about, which is only about like the coding gain and the complexity. And the coding gain and the complexity is, is also very important, but we have to consider other factors as well. And another important factor we need to consider is the wide support by the devices, right? either especially by, by the mobile devices. There are a lot of all kinds of mobile devices. And supporting a codec is, could mean a hardware support or a software support. For hardware support, it basically means the SOC chips inside the mobile devices need to support the codec. And by software support, it basically means, especially for the encoding, it has to be simple enough to be able to run in real time by the CPUs in the mobile devices. So it's a, a very involving and a complete catered process for evaluation. Let alone the user experience also depends on like the display devices as well. So there are a lot of factors to evaluate this. Mark? Yeah, thank you for, for pointing that out, Sean. You know, one of the things that comes to mind with what you just said is, is um, really being mindful of what the use case is, what the device ecosystem is, because um, adopting a codec is as much about the application as it is about the performance or the benefits of the codec. And so, um, you know, I'm curious if uh, somebody else can jump in and maybe give some color around uh, where the MPEG codecs 
stand in terms of the types of devices that they typically are supported on and where um, the, you know, v VP8, VP9, AV1, kind of the Google onto, uh, you know, where those fit because they do look pretty different. The, 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 the device ecosystems are, are pretty different and I think it's important for us to talk about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mark, uh, I can maybe jump in here, but uh, I have other experts here. Uh, and there are other experts here on the panel as well on the on the ecosystem side. But indeed, the first step in determining your, your format is really looking at, yeah, who do you want to reach? Because as, as you said, there are very different, um, let's say, deployments for the different formats. And, and you saw it a bit on the first slide as well, like AVC used to be this almost exceptional success in terms of deployment it was basically it's 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 on billions of devices it's on all major browsers it's on all um let's say uh supported on pretty much everywhere now after avc you have more efficient formats but they're not supported everywhere you have um, vp9 was deployed more on androids uh, chrome and firefox on the other side you have hevc which is um, enabled on um Edge, Microsoft Edge, for example, but not on other major browsers. Uh, it is it is enabled though on iOS devices. So you have this split up also in, in CE devices between Android and iOS. And this is one of the major factors that also uh, will determine which, which formats, which standards you want to deploy. And um, in the past, it was easy. I mean, you had AVC. Now it's uh, also this, uh, you will go for perhaps HEVC for certain premium content. You would see that on Netflix and Disney Plus. Uh, but on the Android side, um, on, on certain browsers, you would be using VP9. And more and more now, you would be using AV1 because AV1 is also ready for prime time. So it's a bit of a, of a complex puzzle that, that you should solve first in terms of reach of the devices. Um, so that's indeed the first step even before you start selecting encoders. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, very good point. Let me add a little bit of uh, uh, like uh, to what the uh, the complexity aspect of an encoder that was touched uh, uh, just a while back. I think the, there is a, a big difference between releasing a codec for VOD applications and releasing a, a codec for deployment in a real time conferencing application, because uh, the uh, uh, in a large uh, uh, largely the how the system, the codec behaves in a system depends on the amount of computation you can do. And so in today's codecs like AV1, VVC, or even HEVC, the search space is so huge. In a real-time application, you can never search that. So whether you really get the benefit out of a, deploying a new codec versus a previous generation codec depends to a large extent on the smartness you can put in on the encoder side. So without that smartness, you'd probably be about the same as H.264 or yeah, like an like an older codec. So I think uh, uh, so. I what we have been seeing is like between a codec being released, a codec format being released, and the time when it actually can be used uh, in a in a real time conferencing uh, application is usually two to three years of development and research cycle that needs to be spent on it. Now, um, of course, I think uh, that's the way that uh, the things have been going, but it is potentially possible that we could probably change the way we standardize codecs. And if we did that, maybe that, that time to market for real-time codecs can actually be shorter. But it's a, it's a difficult problem to, uh, to get everybody on board to really agree to having, let's say, two different codecs standardized at the same time or maybe have one codec being a subset of a, of a larger bitstream syntax. Um, yeah, that's, that's the thought I had on, uh, on yep. real-time codecs and deployment. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, all, you know, amazing comments and uh, thank you for your um, observations there. You know, maybe this also is a good time to talk a little bit about the role of the decoder and, um, and I'm thinking from a little bit of a different perspective, obviously we care about devices that can decode the bit streams. So, and that's already been mentioned, but I'm wondering if any of you have some comments uh, when it comes to actually optimizing the encoder, 
Is it possible to also that there's some optimization that can be done or should be done in the encoder to facilitate better, smoother, maybe lower power consumption decode playback? And so I guess, you know, throw, throw this question out there. Um, what is the role of the decoder when we're talking about optimizing these new advanced, much more advanced codex standards? So uh, if I can, I can start off uh, with that. Uh, so initially when, let's say, as to give an example from VP9 and everyone that we have seen in the last few years, like right after the bitstream is uh, is frozen, it's always very easy to release, uh, or it's much easier to release codecs that can be decoded in software. Yeah. Um, so when you're decoding, let's say, everyone or VP9 in software, uh, and you want to make sure that the browser can actually keep up and play back, let's say 4K, uh, 60 and so on. We do definitely need to do a lot of tricks on the encoder side, actually turn off certain tools that are harder to decode uh, to really keep up the throughput. So that we routinely do. But as, as hardware becomes available and hardware support becomes uh, more uh, ubiquitous, then I think that pressure releases. Um, so we can actually use all the set of tools that uh, the, the format supports. Um, now, that's only up to a point. Let's say if you are getting to the stage of, let's say, VVC or uh, or AV2 or AV Next, or whatever the name of the next AOM codec would be if it happens. Um, there, let's say if we use uh, tools that are much more complex to decode than traditional codecs, let's say if we use an ML-based tool, then I think it could be a problem. So it, um, like it may not be possible to actually support decoding that in software uh, period if we have those tools enabled in the in the profile uh, but we are kind of a few years away from that stage so so far until ev1 or vvc it seems um, uh, we should be able to get the uh, software decoding throughput uh, up to 4k vvc i'm not quite sure yet but maybe yes Everyone certainly, yes. I'll add to what you said, Deborah, because we went through a similar experience when uh, we started using VP9 as well. Um, uh, however, I'd like to take one step back is um, we start seeing more and more hardware people in the standardization groups, and that's for this specific reason, so that when people suggest new features or new tools for the encoding, we know that the decoding or the implementation of those features on the decoder side are reasonably feasible and reasonably uh, doable within a, a reasonable time frame with the current or next generation technology yeah. or, or uh, silicon capability. So that is taken care of early enough, but obviously uh, even after the encoder release, there is challenges to make sure those things happen, right? So there is, there is kind of a check at every single uh, step of adding new tools or features during the development process of the standards. Um, however, um, I, I feel it's true that sometimes, you know, um, for software development, it's really hard. And I echo what uh, Deborah just said. It's, it's really hard to have all these features supported. So going with the subset, uh, the challenge there becomes uh, how much compression efficiency. Would I be interested on in deploying an AV1 where you have cut 10 or 20 of the main features that give me the compression savings? And, and that's kind of the balance where uh, engineering teams, when they try to implement uh, an encoder, try to kind of segregate. And in general, this is a little challenging because you won't always find coordination between people who are writing the decoders and people who are writing the encoders. These in general are different teams, right? So unless these are a very limited set of features, I remember VP9 has got like the tiling enabled in the first few days, right? And number of reference frames as well. Going deep in the details, but that, that was kind of one way to get it out of the way, but now it's uh, the full set of features in the spec are enabled. So that's the ultimate goal. But would it be a facilitator mm -hmm. number of steps? It's super challenging, but definitely it's a way forward, yes, to, to enable faster deployment. Yeah. You know, there's there's one feature that comes to mind that I think really illustrates what we're saying here and what you just said um, and what, what both of you said is um, um, uh, scalable, you know, SVC, scalable video coding, or, you know, um, the ability to adjust um, uh, temporal 
rates, uh, that's in HEVC, right? In the HEVC standard, but it's not required and it's not implemented or rarely implemented on the player side. And yet it's an incredible, uh, incredibly valuable feature in real-time communication specifically. And it is in the standard and required and supported by the, by the decoders, by the players in AV1, right? So um, there's some there's some specific you know tools and 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 even features of these codecs which um, when they're first published and everybody's excited about it everybody talks about it but then you look at what actually is deployed and and you can be sort of let down a little bit you know and that can be in the form of compression efficiency that doesn't live up to you know the gains that we hope to get um, or just features that you know sure I can implement it but it's not going to play back everywhere. You know, the bitstream is not going to be compatible. So. Mm -hmm. I also like to share a couple of examples of how we jointly optimize the encoding and the decoding. So making use of the decoder side information for some encoder side decision making greatly benefits the whole end to end user experience. One typical example is that we can select a reference picture based on the feedback message from the decoder. So this way, we are always guaranteed at the decoder side, the reference picture is always available so that decoding can be always carried on. Otherwise, when the reference picture is lost, or then the decoding would be broken. This is example one. Another example is that we also Consider factors like the computation power of the receiving device as well as the network condition so that we can make decisions on the encoder side what is resolution if we can reduce the resolution of the video or reduce the frame rate of the video to be encoded. Then at the decoder side, we can actually make use of other compensation tools such as super resolution or frame rate interpolation to increase the video quality or frame rate so that at the decoder side we can get uh, uh, the user experiences back to a, a better level even though the network condition is challenging. So decisions like this based on both decoder side and encoder side information greatly benefit the whole end-to-end -end system. And also as Mark comment, the scalability is also a way to, to, to build into the B-stream so that when, when the downlink bandwidth is limited, we can just send part of the B-stream in terms of the control scalability to the receiver while Another receiver which have a good bandwidth would receive the whole bit stream so that it adaptively, adaptively dispatch the bit streams to the receiver. All those are great examples of how the whole system can be optimized jointly. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Why don't we uh, talk about the state? of, uh, and I guess we can start with AV1 or VVC, doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and start with VVC. And, uh, you know, let's just talk about the state of VVC. So uh, where are we at? Um, has anybody done testing? I, I think we would all be interested, even the panelists, to hear uh, maybe what some preliminary findings are in terms of efficiency gains over HEVC or over AV1, if you have that data. Uh, and any other information that might be um, relevant or useful? Yeah, I can go first. I think in the uh, last year, no, year before last, I think right after AV1 was finalized and VVC was not yet finalized, we had done some tests comparing AV1 versus VVC and HEVC. And uh, so at that time, there was no really good implementation. So AV1 has a had the common test conditions, which is very different from the common test conditions used in MPEG. So it's very hard to do an apples to apples comparison. But what we did was we took the best implementation of everyone and the best implementation of VVC, which was some version of uh, VTM at the time. 
and then compared and then and then VVC did turn out to be better in a in a uh, in a VOD, VOD scenario like uh, the full complexity and all that and then at this um, so now going forward in 2020 early 2021 we did some tests with the latest VTM compared to everyone and VVC and in our opinion in the best possible way we can match the uh, parameters to to match the common test conditions everyone seems right in the middle of between HEVC and VVC in terms of coding efficiency um, so that's that's our uh, our best guesstimate so far but uh, there's some work that is going on in the in the broadcast side on 3GPP and DBB and all that to get a really good handle on that but that's our best estimate so far in terms of um, performance in a VOD use case when you have full complexity yeah. Now the real time usage is is I think we don't we don't have any enough data on that for VVC. Understand, and and just just for completeness, were you testing Debarga with uh, LibOM? Was it li probably not LibOMRT, but uh, LibOM yes, or Libo which implementation? LibOM, okay. which is the slowest speed or speed yeah. zero, yeah, compared yeah, exactly. to uh, VTM. Uh, okay, I believe the six in some version yeah okay do you recall by chance uh, even some basic numbers of what the encoding times were the differences were between you know av1 and bvc um, oh yeah or did you normalize been... for encoding time uh, we didn't we didn't we just ran the best possible way we can run vtm and best possible way you can run everyone while matching yeah. the common test conditions as much as possible. And uh, at the time we tested, uh, VTM was way slower than LibOM, but I don't, uh, it's just, uh, I think it's a state of development of VVC of maybe course. more behind here. Of course, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, th I think it's um, a pretty fair statement uh, what Debarga said about um, AV1 being somewhat in the middle between HVC and, uh, and VVC, that's also my observation. Um, recent publications report about, yeah, depending on the conditions between 25 and 40% for VVC, more or less, uh, that's comparing, that's between both reference software packages. Um, and, and, and AV1, uh, we've, we've also measured to, to be, it to be, uh, somewhere in the middle, uh, 15, 20, 25%, uh, depending on, on the settings. Um, it's a little bit of the question, how how much this will change when you go to real time? Because I mean, for AV1, we've seen uh, very good encoders. I mean, LibOM is out there, SVT AV1 is out there, but you also have proprietary encoders. Um, if you look at the Moscow State University results, there's some interesting encoders out there as well that can uh, that can also handle real time at, at high resolutions. So there, there's quite a, some interesting results out there also for real time. For VVC, um, We've tried the, uh, the VV Enc encoder, which is uh, available open source. Um, it is it is much faster, or you can run it much faster at least than the, than the reference software. It's like a, a factor of 100x um, if you give up some of the gains. Um, but it's not, I mean, real time, it's, it's, it, it's not yet fully there yet. So it's hard to compare, let's say, VVC and, and AV1 at sure. that point. So we're looking forward to, I mean, we're also working on on that um, and, and we're looking forward to um, showing more results about that uh, in the near future. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, I also feel like for real time, when you're getting to the stage of real time, I think uh, what starts mattering more is really how you optimize the encoder and rather than the actual bitstream syntax. Uh, yeah. Mm. I, I, I wanna follow up on that actually. Um, the out of the box comparison without taking consideration of um, the performance of a cycle is consumed is, is important when we come to say ultimately the best ever AV1 versus DVC encoder, what is the delta here from a, a pure research and technology point of view? When we come to RTE, which is the purpose of this yeah. topic, is, um, can it be done within the reasonable cost? Can it be done within a reasonable set of cycles? It's true that when AV1 came in a couple of years back, it was super slow. LibAOM was kind of the only version out there, and people were kind of saying, no, there is no way for this to get anywhere near real-time applications, right? So it was a joke. I was in MPEG conferences and people kind of were making fun of the speed. However, over the last couple of years, we have seen 
phenomenal jumps as as VVC has already made improvement, or VV Inc have made improvement for VVC. We are seeing A1 encoders running real time software today. And I think Mark, you can probably see yes. that for the whole hour. But even SVT AV1 has made huge improvements. Lib AOM have made a massive jump. Obviously, this comes at a, a compression efficiency cost, right? However, these are still showing substantial benefits. One piece of data I want to briefly share, and this was publicly published recently. Um, the advantage of SVT AV1 or, and other AV1 encoders is they started running at a comparable cost, at a comparable number of cycles as AVC today. So uh, mm -hmm. if you take the cost of AVC today, you have a platform running some AVC encoders. You can still run AV1. Um, I'm not going to say real time, but at a fast enough speed that you can definitely see some benefit on existing platforms and technology. VVC came in late, it's probably a year old mm -hmm. now, and definitely will make some progress. Uh, but it will take time, and I think the delta of when the standard came out will make a little difference in terms of deployment and market share as well, which which we'll see um, hopefully happening in the next few years. Mm. That's great. Mm. Yeah, and I also like to share one data point. When we selecting the like evaluating the H.264 video codec and the one of the commonly used code base is the X264, where we think the most feasible speed level of X264 is at the very fast speed level. The median is still way too, comp way too complex. So let's say something about how excruciating the requirements for the simplicity of the encoder is. And having said that, we are seeing implementations of AV1 is approaching like only like four to five times as complex as the X264 at very fast speed level. So when it's, if it could go down further to like 2x or to 3x as much complexity, then it's very likely can be used in a lot of use cases for real-time communication, real-time engagement. Yeah, we, we see the light of the tunnel in this direction. And the history has to say that smart algorithms with the progress as time goes on, so is with the CPU capability. So when both this are improved enough, then we will see real-time applications of the EV1 improvement. Yeah, that's a great comment. And I'm curious, do the, do the panelists agree, do the rest of you agree with what Sean just said, that when you get to a complexity of say two to maybe at most three X, that's kind of the tipping point of when you really could consider adopting, um, certainly at least for real time and at scale an advanced Kodak. Do, do you all agree with that? Or how do you think about that? Uh, for, for me, at least it's a cost factor, right? Um, yeah. If two X is gonna save me two Y in delivery cost, you know, it's, it's about how the heat will balance. But I definitely agree in a scalable platform. I'm sure Sean is going through the same challenges. We have hundreds of thousands of concurrent channels. You're offering these transcodes to a single viewer, right? Sometimes for a specific application. So the cost is key here to be able to offer this technology to viewers. So if you have a channel with low viewership and you still need to transcode, it must justify the cost, right? Yeah. So definitely any increase is important. I cannot say whether 2x or 3x is important, but definitely, as he mentioned, x264 very fast is very well deployed in the industry mm -hmm. today. And that's a preset that people are surviving with. Increasing that, doubling that becomes a challenge and you need to justify it. Got it, right. got it. So, so for us, we, we care about uh, the software implementation of the uh, uh, a standard because in software implementation, we are able to, as I just said, we are able to combine a lot of information from the decoder side, from the network. So software implementation would provide a lot of flexibility or programmability to, to provide better quality of experience. So that's why we emphasize the simplicity of a, of a encoder as well, 
Meanwhile, we still would expect like about 50% more coding efficiency compared with the H.264 at the very fast speed, very fast speed level. I mean, X.264. What is the role of hardware in this discussion? Hard hardware for encoding, hardware encoding. And hardware encoder encoding definitely has some benefits as well. First, the, the hardware acceleration usually is less power consuming. So it's the hardware encoding or codec can actually is a good thing for mobile devices because of its low, it's less power consumption. Yeah, so so we need to come up with a strategy of switching back and forth between hardware encoder and the software encoder depends on the the, the, the battery, le battery level or depends on the capability of the hardware. So we have those kind of auto-adjust mechanisms built in to decide whether or when to use the hardware encoding or software encoding. Yeah, I think about that, I think uh, uh, one thing I wanted to add is, so when you, even for a software encoder, it seems like it takes uh, two to three years to actually optimize a full-blown uh, like uh, codec, a new codec, and to make it usable for real-time applications. And uh, to find the real, al the right algorithm that can actually search the this huge space in a, in a very efficient way. Now the hardware also encoders also have the same problem. Plus you have the additional time that you need to spend for uh, the silicon and all that. There are some differences because you can search certain things in parallel much more easily and things like that. But otherwise, uh, some of the algorithm changes or improvements will still be needed for hardware. So typically, what happens is the hardware encoders come kind of evolve maybe at least three to four years after a bitstream has been finalized for a codec. And now that's almost about the time when we are thinking of a next gen codec. Next gen. Um, so, <laughs> so I think uh, there's always this delay that uh, that happens. So that's the reason why I am of the opinion that actually to reduce that uh, time for adoption, I think the entire way we standardize codecs probably needs uh, overhaul and rethink. Like whether it, so at the whenever from a, a bitstream is finalized to the time it can actually be used. Uh, for software and hardware applications that can be much smaller um, yeah. if the way we uh, we standardize codecs and evaluate codecs during development is changed fundamentally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's definitely, uh, I mean, a different in use case, right? You see, and there are use cases for both hardware and software. So I can imagine um, uh, also for, uh, for massive scale deployments that hardware can definitely give advantages. Uh, but what we like about software as well is um, just the flexibility in deployment. Um, you can deploy anywhere on uh, commonly available um, CPUs uh, in the cloud, uh, anywhere you want. Also, the agility of development, how fast you can get to, I mean, good encoder improvements and adoption. And also the flexibility in adding features, for example. Um, you're less bound to your hardware. Uh, you can more easily add features into your pipeline, new algorithms, new innovation. Um, although I, I am impressed by how fast some of these uh, recent uh, hardware announcements have been made, for example, for AV1. Um, but I, I see benefits to both, uh, to both cases for sure. Yeah, excellent. Well, good. Well, uh, we, we could spend more time, but I want to make sure we get to AI and, and machine learning. We talked about how, you know, that also is becoming a, a really important and valuable um, uh, part of this whole discussion. So let's, you know, let's, let's jump in. And uh, when we were preparing for this talk, I know that all of you had some really interesting insights. And so I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to throw it out there. And again, whoever wants to jump in and, and start sharing your thoughts, what you're doing, what you're seeing, and let's just keep it focused on, you know, where can AI and machine learning today? So it's great to talk about the future, but um, where today can, uh, you know, can uh, using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches, you know, in the codec really bring benefits? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Sean, you want to go first or what? 
<laughs> you, you, okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, AI, it's a very popular topic, of course. Um, and uh, we, we, we get a lot of questions around it. There's a lot of uh, announcements around it. I, I often have to like adjust the expectations around AI because like uh, algorithms or neural networks, deep neural networks and so on, it's, it's one thing. Applying them in encoding and definitely in real time encoding is another thing. Um, if you look at many of these, um, of these networks, they have dozens of layers with millions of multiplications going on. I mean, just replacing some algorithm in your encoder by this deep neural network, is, it's not going to work. Or your, um, the cost of encoding is just going to explode massively. So you have to be very mindful of where you apply it, definitely in real-time encoding. Um, you want to be looking for heavily optimized algorithms that limit the number of multiplications, for example. And then, yeah, you want to maybe minimize the footprint by pruning the networks, by quantizing let's say the the let's say the, the the depth of your of your multiplications your your oper operands and so on so i mean there's a lot of deep knowledge both on the codex side and the machine learning side and the optimization going on but once you combine that i do believe that there are several areas where um, ai can help us and we've seen that for example in making our encoders more uh, more flexible, more content aware, um, improving our bit prediction for rate control, for example. Another important area that um, not only that we've seen, but also that I've seen announcement on is around pre-processing, for example, pre-processing, post-processing, something that uh, these algorithms are particularly suited for. So there's quite some areas where it, where it can help, but you have to be very mindful of the complexity. And fortunately, also in standardization bodies, there's definitely a tendency to focus a lot on that complexity so we don't like screw up the people that have to implement it later on. <laughs> um, there's definitely awareness that it can be very costly. So that's that's a good trend. Right. John is definitely correct to point out that we have to be mindful when we design a deep learning algorithm to help video encoding. We, we have actually come up with quite a few deep learning models for the mobile devices, for example, super resolution is one, and the frame rate interpolation is another. And also, we have designed a CNN convolutional network based perceptual video coding strategy, which basically captures the human visual perception for the distortion because we are, our eyes are sensitive to some distortions, while not so sensitive to uh, other distortions, especially for areas with very complicated textures. Distortions is not that visible. So we can take advantage of this by design of very small deep learning models. So the, the quite the few deep learning models I just mentioned, the number of parameters is just in the range of a few k parameters, unlike the usual deep learning models which have millions of parameters. So this greatly reduced deep learning models is actually executed in real time in almost uh, a wide range of mobile devices, high end, middle end, some of them can be even implemented on low end mobile devices. For example, the, the perceptual video coding model I just mentioned can do like 17, 20p frame encoding uh, for very low and model devices. And also, uh, yeah, we also have make use of machine learning and deep learning for standard compliant B stream generation. As the, uh, for example, so for the mode decision, for the block partition decision, as well as the uh, Different control as John pointed out, and even amazing that for for scenarios like usage cases like this, we, we are trying to convey the most important information that the first frame of a person is already conveys identity information is already there. So the next would just would be like we would be able to. Transmit 
a few key points, a visual key points. Then we can make use of the visual key points to generate or reconstruct the video based on the identity information from the first frame. So those kind of technology is already there. And the, for, 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 uh, from the generated deep learning models, like the GAN, the generative adversarial network, the variational autoencoder, all those things uh, actually can help achieve the, the intention I just mentioned. So the question is how small we can design the model so that it can be executed on mobile devices. So stuff like this uh, are very exciting and very promising. Mark? Well, maybe maybe next year this panel um, should just be solely focused on AI and ML because I, I feel like we 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 really didn't get to get into the meat of the topic and and there's just so much exciting development happening uh, there. So we are uh, looking at the clock here. We're five minutes to the top of the hour and we do need to keep on schedule. Um, if there are any questions, I encourage you to just go to the uh, question box. Uh, I, I, I believe that we don't want to use the chat just because it can get kind of cluttered up, but go to the question box and um, um, you know, put a question in there and we would love to address it as, as we have time. Uh, I think you know to close. There is a there. There are some questions here which uh, were answered. Uh, th uh, thank you, Debarga. I know you jumped in here, uh, but I think um, it's probably relevant to everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and read through some of these, and and then um, um, you know uh, we can see what else comes in. Uh, but there's a question about what about Apple OS X and iOS. And uh, I am inferring as I read through that, that that this person is asking about AB1 support in the Apple ecosystem. Um, I, I, I guess I, I can answer that one really quick um, sure. because it, it, it's, it's public. Uh, you know, Apple is a founding member uh, of the Alliance for Open Media. Um, obviously, Apple, like really all companies, uh, but as we know, Apple's even a little more tighter lipped. Uh, you know, they don't divulge their roadmaps. So I don't think anyone on this call would be prepared or even able to try and offer any future guidance. Um, but considering that Apple is a founding member of the Alliance for Open Media, you can infer that, you know, um, they have a lot of things to be working on. And if they weren't interested, they probably wouldn't you know, be a member and, and participating. Does anybody else have anything to add? Uh, uh, Debarga, do you want to jump in there? Or? Oh, yeah. So I think the only one thing I wanted to add is, yes, so we don't know anything public about Apple, but I think uh, one thing is, I think for the next gen work that is going on in the AOM work group, I think uh, Apple is very, very involved. And we have yeah. seen several And you're speaking of, uh, of AV2 yep. specifically, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, that is that is correct. Um, okay, let's see. How does AV1 compare to the older codecs for uh, under 4K streams? So basically lower resolution, I guess you could say HD and then SD, mm -hmm. and um, especially considering the computational expense. So that's that's actually a great question. Yeah. Um, who wants to? Yeah. So I, I can I can give you a little bit of it's not an easy question to answer, especially here you have the computational part in it. If you didn't co consider computation, then I believe uh, for resolutions lower than 4K, and that is what the common test conditions for AV1 were. They're all less than 4K. Uh, at the time of the bitstream freeze, it was about 30% better than VP9, and uh, today maybe closer to 35 to 40% 30, better than uh, VP9. Um, so that's and if you, so that's how how it compares against VP9. Now uh, we have different in the LibM, which is sort of like the reference software. We have different speed settings that you can choose. So as you increase the speed level, then what happens is the that gain is going to reduce. And roughly, if you go to speed five, like zero to five is like several steps. Five is not quite real time, but uh, getting there. Uh, will be losing maybe 10%, but compared against VP9 again at the full resolution, uh, at the full uh, complexity. So I think uh, uh, that 
35 to 40 percent still stays at the same complexity level as um, as VP9. So I think that overlap area of the complex computation between VP9 and everyone is relatively small. So it's not very easy to get a uh, get a good feel for that. Um, but I would let any someone who has more experience on the real time side to chime in also. Uh, Maybe I, in 20 seconds, very quickly. Uh, yeah. During the standardization days, AV1 came in as one of the codex where the compression savings are very noticeable at low resolution as well. Uh, although in other standards like HEVC and even VVC as well, the gains started diminishing a little bit as you go to smaller resolution. The complexity question or the CPU cost is pretty hard to answer here. Yeah, um, I, and, and I'll just jump in too with a comment um, because Visionular has done quite a bit of, um, of, of work. And um, the, where I want to focus is on the uh, AMD versus Intel platforms. And this also is, is an important consideration just because um, the architecture of those two platforms is different. You have more cores and some implementations are optimized um, to um, work in certain use cases, maybe a little more efficiently on one platform than another. So uh, I, I guess that really the takeaway here is, and, and you know, apologize, you don't have the time and you know, can't really go into all the details, but um, if you go to av1info.com, uh, av1info.com, there's some very, very good benchmarks comparing live performance uh, on, on uh, Intel based uh, architectures and then on AMD. So it might be interesting to people as well. Uh, okay, so it's 10.01. Uh, I, I guess we, we, we should stop here. As usual, this conversation could easily have gone on for another hour. So I want to thank everyone, um, starting with our panelists. So thank you, panelists, for, uh, for joining us. And um, uh, everyone who hung in to the end, I uh, really appreciate you. And uh, I guess until uh, next year, um, uh, you know, this is uh, a continuously evolving landscape. So um, next year we'll be here talking about maybe a, a little bit of the same and, and some new things. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, Mark, Jan, Sean, Debaga, and Tarek for an insightful discussion into video codec standards. I've definitely learned a thing or two or just learned how little I know about video encoders and decoders. Uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed this talk and we'll stick around for more of the events and sessions happening today and tomorrow at RTE 2021.